Well, hello everybody and welcome. You have tuned in to episode number 441 of Linux in the Hamshack, the most terrific amateur radio podcast on the internet. And tonight, episode 441 is our short topics episode, so we'll be bringing you news from the world of amateur radio and from open source, and we'll be mixing those together a little bit later on for our Linux in the Hamshack segment. But before we dive into all the news that you can use, we should introduce ourselves. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD. All right, so let's just go ahead and dive right into it. I guess I'll hit the first amateur radio topic we've got tonight, since I actually cut and pasted this in here. And that doesn't mean I'll be able to read it, but we'll try anyway. So the first topic we have is ARIS. That's amateur radio on the International Space Station, and others benefit from ARDC grants. They're giving out all kinds of money from that 44 block. The Amateur Radio on the International Space Station program, ARIS, is one of several groups receiving grants recently from ARDC, the organization created to administer the Ampernet, which we just mentioned, and support other efforts through proceeds of selling off some 4 million unused addresses within that domain. The three-part grant to ARIS covers five years and totals nearly $1.3 million. According to the ARRL letter, part one of the grant will pay for taking an ARIS-developed wireless electronics technology kit for students from prototype to operational program. Part two will fund educator workshops for teachers planning to use these kits in preparation for ARIS contacts. And part three will help support the ongoing cost of setting up and conducting amateur radio contacts between students and space station crews. The letter also reports that the Oregon HamWAN organization has received an $88,000 ARDC grant to expand its high-speed digital network in the Portland area and to improve amateur radio emergency communications capabilities between Portland and the state capital in Salem. Moving down the coast to California, ARDC is giving the Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club $35,550.06 to build a ham station at the new Crispin California Island Center in Carpentaria. The installation will include a touchscreen, so that's where my cursor went, a touchscreen controlled interactive presentation on amateur radio and other wireless technologies to engage visitors when the station is not staffed. Yeah, typed typed random crap in a random place, (laughs) which made that really hard to read. But anyway, yes, more benefits to the amateur radio world, including the space station, which is really cool, from ARDC. I I love these grant proposals. They, They really take these grants literally when they say they need three thousand you know three thousand six hundred and seventeen dollars and twelve cents that's exactly what they get not up anymore <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that has something to do with their 501c3 i don't know but anyway really cool lots of projects coming out of this and ardc is helping a lot of hams do a lot of great things and that story actually came from cq magazine or at least the online version thereof so pretty cool to hear from them I haven't actually seen that magazine in quite a while so I, I don't even know if they have a, a print version anymore, but apparently they're still a thing. Sure. I see emails for them every once in a while. Oh, huh, okay. Digital subscription is, I think. Yeah, makes sense. ARRL is the only one foolish enough to put out an actual print publication anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So moving on, let's go ahead to the next one. And uh, Cheryl, do you want to read this one? This one's kind of easy. And Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm not I'm not face bagging tonight. I'm Amazoning. So anyway, <laughs> the next story is the 2022 ARRL Handbook for Radio Communication is now available, and the information here says the ARRL hand- wow ARRL Handbook for Radio Communication for 2022 is a must have for every amateur radio bookshelf. Whether you're an experienced ham or new to the hobby, you'll find information you can use to advance your amateur radio knowledge and skills. This current comprehensive and complete reference is available in three formats. Traditional soft cover, a six-volume shrink-wrapped book set, and digital ebook. The 2022 edition features new projects and tools, including 3D printing techniques for ham radio construction, battery selection for portable operation, analog to digital converter overload, Solid state amplifier linearity, an amplifier on, or excuse me, an update on Solar Cycle 25 and more. The handbook six volume book set is $59.95 retail. The handbook softcover book is $49.95 retail. 
More new books have also been stocked in the ARRL store, including the second edition of Grounding and Bonding for the Radio Amateur by Ward Silver in Zero AX. This new edition shows you how to make sure your station follows current standards for lightning protection and RF grounding. It details effective grounding and bonding techniques for the home, portable or mobile station, as well as towers and antennas. It's a book I should probably read because I don't think there's a single grounded thing anywhere here. So. Probably <laughs> not, no. <laughs> Including the house. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And as we mentioned before, if you do not have an ARRO handbook in your possession, you should probably think about getting one. They are really useful information to have as a reference piece of material. I have at least two or three different years here, including one from the 80s, which is the one that literally sits right next to my desk. So <laughs> definitely worthwhile purchase. You probably won't regret it. Yeah, not terribly expensive either, even for the six-volume set. Yeah, yeah. And if you go to enough ham fest, you'll probably win a $50 ARRL gift card at some point. So that'll that'll knock most of the price off of that. So you'll be all set to go. Yeah, there you go. All right. So moving on, we have one more story in our amateur radio segment for tonight. And we'll let Bill cover that one. Okay. This is uh, imaging the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant with an RTLSDR and amateur radio telescope. Just a few days ago, we posted, that would be the rtlsdr.com folks posted about job a job Gehenis, Gehenos, Gehen, Gehen, why do i always get these weird names job, <laughs> <laughs> well i'm not gonna mess it up anymore job g's success at radio imaging with uh cygnus uh, x star forming region at 1424 megahertz with a 1.9 meter radio telescope an rtl sdr and some additional filtering and lnas now, in his latest post on Facebook, uh, Job G has also shown that he has successfully imaged Cassiopeia A with the same equipment. Cassiopeia A is a supernova remnant known for being the brightest extrasolar radio source in the sky at frequencies above 1 gigahertz, according to the Wikipedia. Uh, Job G writes, a new observation from the JRT... These are drift scans of Cassiopeia A to make a radio plot. Several drift scans are made last week and combined. Always nice to see what's possible with a 1.5 to 1.9 meter dish, two LNAs, and a bandpass filter connected to an RTL SDR at 1424 megahertz. Happy that I got Cygnus Complex and now a Cassiopeia A, which is a second radio source, which is possible to receive with this dish. Uh, the dish is fully remote controlled, 50 kilometers away, probably to keep it away from all the noise in his house. <laughs> <laughs> and everything else. I'm sure you want a nice clear sky to yeah. hear things in that frequency range at that distance. But pretty cool. Lots of low cost technology there to do really neat things. So go get yourself an RTL SDR. <laughs> All right. Moving on from amateur radio topics, we have some open source topics. And we're going to let Bill dive right into this one because this this will be more stuff he can screw up. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, this is uh, Luau goes open source. Uh, when Roblox, Roblox was created 15 years ago, we chose Lua, L-U-A, uh, the language, L Lua, L-U-A, yeah, as a scripting language. Lua was small, fast, easy to embed and learn, and opened up enormous possibilities for our developers. A lot in Roblox was built on Lua, including hundreds and thousands of lines of internally developed code that powers Roblox apps and Roblox Studio to this day and the millions of experiences that developers have created. For many of you, it was the first programming language you learned. A few years ago, we started looking at looking into how we can evolve Lua to be even faster, have better ergonomics, make it easier to write robust code, and unlock the ecosystem of rich tooling from better static analysis to IDE integrations. And that's integrated development environment for uh, all you acronym people. In integrated uh, integrations. <laughs> integrated integrations, yeah. Uh, this is how Luau was born, and I'm only assuming that it's Luau because it's L-U-A-U. -U. Uh, Luau is a new language that started from Lua 5.1 and kept evolving while keeping backwards compatibility and preserving the original design goals. Simplicity, performance, embeddability. We're incredibly grateful for the foundation that Lua has been. It's been a joy to build on top of. So now we want to give back to the community at large. Starting today, Luau... Uh, is no longer an inseparable part of the Roblox platform. It's separate open source language. Open source, open source, open source. 
Uh, Luau is available at their GitHub site, of course, and it comes uh, with the source code for the language runtime and all associated tooling, a compiler, a type checker, a linter. Uh, the code is available to anyone free of charge under the terms of the MIT license. We're happy to accept contributions to the language, whether that's documentation or source code. The language evolution is driven by an RFC process that is also open to the public. And, of course, that came to us from the Roblox site. And uh, I got familiar with Lua because of uh, World of Warcraft, <laughs> because it's a mod engine uh, or plugin engine, I guess. What would you call those stupid things? I guess mods or plugs, whatever they call it, uh, for the uh, software was all uh, uh, in LUA. So uh, it's pretty pretty easy language to pick up and learn if you have any familiarity, you know, familiarity with uh, uh, any programming language, really. Yeah. Pretty cool. I, I haven't actually looked at Lua myself or Luau or Lua U or whatever the hell it is, but <laughs> sounds interesting. I have played Roblox a couple of times. Yeah, that I haven't done. Yeah. I watched a friend of ours, kids over here playing Roblox, and I was like, oh, that looks mildly interesting. And I played it for five minutes, and I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not, not my kind of game. But all right. So moving on, we have low cost brain computer interface for everyday use. With the growth in electroencephalog, <laughs> I knew I was going to screw that up. With the growth in electroencephalography-based applications, or EEG, the demand for affordable computer consumer solutions is increasing. Here we describe a compact, low-cost EEG device suitable for daily use. Isn't the Apple Watch one of those? I'm pretty sure <laughs> you can uh, take uh, maybe not EEGs, EKGs for sure. Or That's ECGs. an EKG, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is for the brain. Well, I guess if you put the watch strap around your head, of, right? Yeah, strap yeah. an I, I, uh, <laughs> Apple Watch to your skull, and there you go. Get a, you get a couple of them and just get them all the way around. You know? <laughs> the data are transferred from a device to a personal server using the TCP/IP protocol, allowing for wireless op wireless operation and a decent range of motion for the user. The device is compact, having a circular shape with a radius of only twenty five millimeters, which is about an inch, by the way, which would allow for comfortable daily use during both daytime and nighttime. Our solution is also very cost-effective, approximately $350 for 24 electrodes. The built-in noise suppression capability improves the accuracy of recordings with a peak input noise below 0 0.35 microvolts. Here, we provide the results of the test for the developed device. On our GitHub page, we provide detailed specifications of the steps involved in building this EEG device, which should be helpful to readers designing similar devices for their needs. And it was released under the GPL victor three so that's pretty cool and this came from the experimental brain research journal wow we're, we're really reaching <laughs> maybe we should just join <laughs> southgate and <laughs> yes <laughs> well, hello welcome to the southgate podcast and we're uh... <laughs> uh yeah and of course the github will be linked as well so lots of information that's there and it seems like uh this is going to be part of apple watch here before too long you know they're just yeah there'll be a there'll be a little plug-in dock on the top of it or something like that you plug the electrodes in and you'll have an ekg and an eeg and so yeah what are they going to call the product the eye head or eye crown yeah we should we should go ahead and uh, the eye register skull. it all right now Ice skull. There you go. The ice skull, yeah. Might be too close to a skull candy. I don't know if they'd allow that. Probably be a, <laughs> probably there was some kind of argument there. Yeah, well, I've never had a head for marketing. But anyway, let's go ahead and move on. And Bill, we'll let you cover this one because you're the only one who's really had any deep experience with Pipewire. I'm actually using Pipewire now on a couple of machines I installed the latest version of Ubuntu on, but I have not had issues with it so far. So what's yeah. what's new in the, the Pipewire world so we had a release uh, today uh, as of the recording of this podcast. Uh, we had uh, Pipewire 0 0.3.40, and this is a bug fix release, of course, because every release until it gets 1.0 is going to be a, a pretty major bug fix release. Um, yeah, with so many systems on it now, it's uh, it's quite interesting, uh, uh, the development. But anyway, uh, let's see. What do we got here for the improvements on this release? This is uh, producers and consumers can now incrementally negotiate a format by narrowing down the options. This can be used to select an optimal combination of format and modifiers. Uh, driver nodes, such as the consumer of headless compositor, can now throttle the speed based on a new trigger done event. Headless compositors can now signal a damage event to consumers to start processing of a graph. It's all pretty much you know, complex gobbledygook for us. Uh, compatibility improvements with Jack, because we don't know Jack. 
And uh, draining and resuming is now uh, correctly working in Pulse and also. I'm sure that's a good thing for everybody. <laughs> and many bug fixes and improvements. That's that's pretty much the highlight. Many, many bug fixes and improvements. And actually, I just got that update today as of the same day it came out. So um, does it work? Can you hear me? Hello? Is this thing on? <laughs> check, check, one, two, check. Oh, I check, sure one, hope two. so. I'm not recording this again. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm recording, though. <laughs> At least I have my uh, broken sound system working. So... <laughs> Uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah, so that's it. Pipewire's out. Uh, if your system is uh, getting uh, quick update dates, you'll probably see it already, uh, like my system does have that update. Otherwise, uh, you'll probably see it in about 10 years in uh, mainline Ubuntu. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> or 25 well, the years new, in Debian. Right. The new version <laughs> of Ubuntu has Pipewire, so it's it's out there, and, and you will see it. Well. To be in Debian, it actually has to be copy lefted. So I assume that it is. I assume it's GPL or something. But yeah, yeah, it'll get there eventually. You know, <laughs> Arch had it before it was done, and Debian will have it in 2033. <laughs> yeah, and of course, uh, Fedora has it too. And uh, most people have already gone through the Wire Plumber update, which uh, helps fix some of the uh, initial issues. Even Fedora 35 now has Wire Plumber in it. So, uh, yeah, it's just going to continue to improve. Yeah, it will, because we needed another audio subsystem, because apparently, you know, Jack and Pulse Audio and all those things just weren't good enough. And also, X11 wasn't good enough, so somebody had to make Wayland. Yeah, Wayland. <laughs> so, all right, moving on, let's slip into the Linux in the Ham Shack segment. And the first thing we have in here is about Auto FT8. Um, I'm using WSJTZ, which already kind of does this. Uh, Auto FT8 is an experimental project for ham radio operators. Uh, uh. <laughs> I think there's a lot of like lawyers using FT8, unless they're also hams. Uh, this program automatically controls WSJTX to optimize compact contacts chances during a contest or DX, make as many QSOs as possible. After a receive sequence, the program calculates using the distance SNR1 and Azimuth has the most, most chances of completing the QSO. And you threw in here that it's uh, BSD licensed. Okay. Yeah. And written in, and written in, in Python. Python. Yes. So in Python. Now, now I will do want to mention that all of these three items that we're talking about were, were randomly picked from deep dumpster diving into the GitHubs. So just looking at projects that just recently got updates and uh, I just picked out three uh, ones that looked kind of interesting. I just kind of just explored the code. I didn't get a chance to actually try them out. Um, but uh, yeah, so your mileage may vary if you're interested in this, but you, you might be able to find something here that uh, interests you as well. Okay, I'm trying to parse out that last sentence. I understand what it means, but I'm not understanding what it does. After a receive sequence, the program calculates using the distance signal to noise ratio and azimuth, which has the most chance of completing a QSO, which, which has... Right, so it, it uses its own little deciding factor to basically weight each thing it heard in the uh, receive sequence to decide which station to go back to. Oh, oh, it's or choosing which stations. station to contact. That's, that's yes. what, okay. That's what I was trying to figure out. It's like, it was doing all these great calculations. What's it trying to figure out? What's, what's on the right-hand side of the equals? Right, which ones that have the highest probability of you actually completing the QSO. And it also has ability to do timeouts and stuff like that, so it'll only try so many times, and then it'll it'll go to the, the next one, or it'll re-get. Re, re so it's actually quite smart. If you look at some of the code, it's it's quite interesting. It's definitely a probably a good good exercise in reviewing some Python code there if you're interested in that stuff. It's uh, it's quite quite interesting. All right, very cool. Well, since this was since all of these stories are GitHub, dumpster dives uh i'll just go ahead and let you finish out the last two okay sounds good yeah this one is uh next one is mod ham radio and this is a free switch module supporting the supporting using sorry this is all out of github so some of these don't make any sense uh free switch module supporting the uh, use of gpio and sound cards to connect to ham radios it's in uh, free switch for those who don't know free switch is a software defined telecom stack for enabling digital transformation from proprietary telecom switches to a versatile software implementation. So basically soft phone switching. <laughs> it is intended to be as generic as possible, allowing the use for a repeater or a remote station. See configuration example inside the conf directory and make your own appropriate 
you know, Etsy free switch config file. And uh, this thing might actually work for you. This is written in C, and it also has the uh, ability to use Hamlib to control the rig. So uh, it, it looks like an interesting project. It's all written in C. Um, again, just just an interesting project. Might uh, If you play around with free switch, this might be something that interests you if you're into ham radio as well. And the last one is ham deck. And this only works for you if you have an Elgato Stream Deck in, uh, interface, a little device, a little desktop device that has buttons on it. But Ham Deck allows you to control and automate your ham radio station using Elgato Stream Deck device. You can define buttons using the JSON configuration file. Ham Deck connects to the local Pulse Audio server, to a Hamlib Rig Control D server, or to an expert SDR through the TCI protocol. Currently, the following actions are implemented as Stream Deck buttons. Uh, they have the ability to toggle the mute state of the Pulse Audio Sync source and sync input or source output. Uh, call any simple hamlib set command. Example is a you know VFO op band up you know, to flip your bands up. Uh, set the mode of your radio through hamlib or TCI. Switch to a specific frequency band through hamlib or TCI. Set the output power level of your radio through hamlib or TCI. Control the TX state uh, MOX of your radio through uh, those two things as well. Uh, select the VFO of your radio through Hamlib. Get an indication of the on the mode buttons, which modes you are suitable to the current frequency according to the IARU Region 1 band plan. So you can tell where this is coming from. Not in our region, but <laughs> sure you can modify that in the configuration. Uh, jump to the center of the closest band portion suitable for your current selected mode. Uh, control the ma major volume of the expert SDR through TCI. This tool is written in Go on Linux, and it might also, it might Quotes, it might also work on OSX or Windows, but I did not try that out. Good for him. Uh, license is MIT license, and of course, it's written in Go. Go, 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 go. Links to all three of those projects are in the show notes, and they're all links to GitHub. Yeah, that's cool. I kind of like that project. I've been looking for quite a while now getting a stream deck for, for the podcasting side of things, but it looks like it might have some more functionality now, which would be kind of interesting. Plus, stream decks are just really cool with all the little LCD buttons and everything. So yeah. it's like it's flashy kit, lots of eye candy. <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, that actually brings us down to the end of our stories for tonight, which means we're going to have to try and pry Cheryl away from Amazon so she can get on here and do the social media roundup, <laughs> which isn't working, <laughs> apparently. I'm here. I was digging in my desk drawer. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's funny how when we're doing the show, you're doing anything but paying attention to the shows. <laughs> no, it's not that I'm not paying attention to the show. I'm reading along. I just decided to grab a pen out of my dress drawer that I then dropped in the floor. So <laughs> Okay. Well, anyway, we are at the social media roundup, so we'll go ahead and let you do the rundown. All right. So for our Patreons this week, we have Reginald Ad, which is new. Thank oh, you. Wait a minute. There's a missing letter there. Let me put that letter in. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Rachel Addo, which is new. Thank you for joining us. William Large, which is also new. Thank you for joining us. And Steve Annis, which is also new. Thank you for joining us. Then we have Andy Cowley, Gary Tibbetts, Bryce Johnston, David Scarf, David Slaughter, Jim Lawson, Patrick Ang, Douglas Shock, Eric Guth, Brandon Rosek, John Spriggs, Robert Lewis, Robert Bitts, Douglas Redder, David Jakeway, Darren King, Cubicle Nate, Erner Castales, Samuel Vimes, Peter Caffrey, Richard Gordon, Paul Griffith, Jonas Rulo, Donald Gover, Herb Garcia, Steve Sainer, Steve Metcalf, William Heckelman, Randolph Smith, and Andy Webster. For our subscriptions, we have Vincent Martin, which is new. Thank you for joining us. Bob Alberg, Paul Mooney, Chris DeLuca, Eric Muller, Carl Backus, Isaac Gear, Thomas Foy, Michael Burdak, Kevin Ivey, Tony Coverley, Ronald Ike, Johnny Kinsey, Peter excuse me, Peter Spots, Fred Cole, Bill Piotr, Jeffrey Boris, Robert Halliday, Wayne Hill, John Clark, Steve Hepler, Michael Jopling, Howard Dittmer, Todd Bowers, Michael Carey, A. Taylor, Dylan Angle, Jim McKenzie, Bill Collins, Robert Black, Darren King, Randolph Smith, Robert Yerke, Steve Biella, Alan Wilson, Mark Farrell, and Jeff Simron. On Facebook, we had Tony, Bru uh, Tony Bunce, excuse me, join us. On Twitter, we had at Zero Retries, at Rosnet, at Scout Again 4, and at K0RAP. On YouTube, we had Mike McDonald. On Discord, we had WU2S underscore Randy, at Vice and Dis, 
and at, or excuse me, Visonus and James Atkinson. Nobody on the mail list and no merchandise sales. All right. Well, thank you for that. And in the chat room, Bike Me mentioned a project that is a Raspberry Pi project to, uh, I guess, uh, provide an interface similar to the Stream Deck called Stream Pi. And despite the fact that it almost caused Bill to aspirate, uh, we should probably mention it <laughs> uh, because it was apparently written in Java FX. But that's something we could look at maybe on a future episode. It looks interesting. And uh, I'm, I'm going to check it out despite, you know, I'm kind of curious. Does it use like a TFT or a TFT screen or something like that to emulate the the buttons of a stream deck? Or does it use a stream deck? You know, there's there's lots of unanswered questions here, but we're not going to answer them tonight. But thanks for mentioning the project, and we'll probably talk about it at some point in the future. But speaking of the chat room, we should mention the folks that were in the chat room. We already mentioned Bike Me. We also had Tony K4XSS, Don KC9ZMY, Ted WA0EIR, EIR, I think I said that close to right, Don KBTYSI, Darren VK60K, and Dan KB6NU, who might be listening or might be doing some 40-meter CW right now. We're not sure. But that takes us down to the end of the show. And we want to thank everybody who listened to the show, everybody who joined us live to uh, entertain us in the chat room while we're recording for you all. And we really want to thank all of our supporters, financial supporters, for helping us keep the lights on. And Dan says he's actually blogging. So <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not just Cheryl who's not paying attention. That, that's okay. Exactly. So... <laughs> yes. Well, he did say we were slightly better than static. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the end of the show. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we hope we'll catch you the next time around when we do our deep dive episode. So make sure you tune in for that. Take care, everyone, and we'll get on out of here. This has been episode number 441 of Linux in the Hamshack. I'm Russ, K5TUX. I'm Cheryl, W5MOO. And I'm Bill, NE4RD73.